and the topic is, is the IC engine dead? I would like to invite the moderator of this session, Mr. Dipankshu Sharma, Editor-in-Chief, Auto Tech Review to the dais, please. I also invite the panelist speakers of this session, Mr. Brian McMurray, Vice President, Engineering and Operations, General Motors Technical Center, India. Let's give a big round of applause. And Mr. Rajendra Petkar, Chief Technology Officer, Tata Motors Limited. Mr. Rafik Somani, Area Vice President, ANSYS India. And Dr. Yves Dieter Grieb, Executive Vice President, AVL Austria. Gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce Mr. Dipankshu Dev Sharma, the chairperson of this session. Dipankshu Sharma is currently the editor in chief of Autotech Review and head of professional publishing at Springer Nature India. A journalist with close to 18 years of professional experience, Dipankshu joined Springer India in January 2011 to conceive and launch a new automotive magazine in India. Autotech Review was thus born as India's first and by far the only automotive technology magazine in the country. The magazine today is the country's most comprehensive automotive B2B portfolio across print, digital, niche technology conferences. Currently, he is spreading a project within the company to build a comprehensive driver training program in sync with the central government's mission of bringing down traffic-related deaths by half. Dipankshu has done plays and anchored shows for All India Radio, Durdarshan in the past, and he also lent his voice to radio and TV commercial. A keen political observer, he is an avid reader, a sports fanatic, and an experimental chef. And someday he wishes to persist dream of being a nursery school teacher. Let's give a big round of applause and invite to Mr. Dipanshu Sharma to take the podium. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction for you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I think we have about uh, 40, 45 minutes of uh, time for this panel discussion. So let me head straight into introducing our panelists for the day today. On the extreme left, uh, we have Mr. Rajendra Petka. He is the Chief Technology Officer at Tata Motors Limited. Mr. Petka uh, is also a member of the Tata Motors Executive Committee. As CTO, he heads the Engineering Research Center and is responsible for leading the product development and engineering function that involves design and development of vast range of vehicles and components for the company's product portfolio. In his previous role as head of power systems engineering division at ERC, he was responsible for design and development of engines, transmissions, and advanced powertrain concepts for the entire value chain of products. Additionally, Mr. Petka represents the organization at various automotive bodies. An alumnus of IIT Mumbai, he commenced his journey with Tata Motors in 1989 as postgraduate trainee engineer. With an illustrious career spanning over 29 years of R&D, he has held key positions and delivered numerous projects bearing significant impact on TML's products and their performance. He holds many patents and research papers to his credit. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Petka to this panel discussion. Yeah. On his, le on his uh, left is Mr. Brian McMurray, he's a vice president of Engineering and Operations at GM Technical Center, India. He has been with GM since 1997 and has held various leadership positions during his stint with GM. He has global experience having worked in England, China, US, and Australia. He moved to India in 2014 as Director, Vehicle Integration, and now heads Engineering and Operations for the India Tech Center. Uh, Mr. McMurray holds an engineering degree from Newcastle and an MBA from New York Institute of Technology. His passion for cars at a tender age of three set the runway for his career trajectory in the automotive sector. Please welcome Mr. McMurray with a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Rafiq Somani is the Area Vice President, South Asia, Pacific and Middle East at ENSYS. Uh, he has over 27 years of experience in IT and technology. Uh, prior to ENSYS, 
Uh, he worked with PTC for 17 years as country manager and earlier worked at TCS and Minicomp Computers. His core strength and experience are in leadership roles, developing business growth and execution strategies for companies and developing go-to-market models. He also specializes in business turnarounds, partner management, and people mentoring. His interviews and articles are regularly published in several leading technology industry magazines. Uh, he is a BE in computer science from M M Mumbai University in 1990 and got his master's in marketing management from NMIMS Mumbai University in 1996. He's very passionate about working towards social causes, skill development, student mentoring, and was chairman of the Aga Khan Education Service India, an AKD and NGO agency. In his free time, he, uh, he likes running marathons, and he's also an amateur ornithologist. Our final speaker on my extreme left is Professor Dr. Uwe Dieter Greb. He is Executive Vice President, Global Business Development, Sales and International Operations Partnering Systems at AVL Graz, Austria. Started his career in 1991, uh, and between 91 and 2012, he was with General Motors and Adam, uh, Adam Opel AG. Until 2002, he was part of numerous engineering positions uh, with growing responsibilities, including manager advanced engine engineering and manager base engine hardware for all gasoline and diesel engines outside North America. In 2004, he joined GM Powertrain in USA as executive director of Global Advanced Engineering. And in 2011, he joined GM Europe as the executive director responsible for the research and advanced engineering activities for vehicle, powertrain, and manufacturing systems, as well as alternative propulsion systems. In addition, uh, he is an honorary professor with the Technical University of Vienna, and is a member of the scientific board of the magazines MTZ and ETZ, uh, which incidentally are, uh, are sister publications in Germany. So uh, the subject of uh, today's panel discussion is is the IC engine dead? Now, you know, we are in an era where uh, there's a lot of talk around alternate propulsion options. And the automotive industry is facing numerous questions about what would the future, what the future really holds. And in recent times, uh, we've had some concerns related to IC engines, although there's also a lot of talk around Electromobility, electrified mobility. Uh, we're talking of hybridized uh, uh, options in the future. What is for sure certain is that over time we will see a lot of vehicles being powered by batteries and electric motors. But the question is what is the role that IC engines will play in the future? And that is what we will try and uh, get answers to from our panelists today. Uh, as you can see, the panelists, we have two members, uh, one, uh, Mr. Petka, from it, representing an OEM. Uh, we have Mr. Somani, he's, he's from a simulation company. Uh, Mr. McMurray represents a tech center for General Motors, and we have Dr. Uh, Grib as, uh, from, a, from a tier one perspective. So, gentlemen, if I could start by asking you your perspectives on the subject of the day. If we could begin with you, Mr. Uh, Petka. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dipanshu. Actually, I can argue the subject both ways, but uh, let me be a little practical to say that uh, the ICE engines will coexist for a very long time. And uh, here are the reasons. If you look at the study by the global consulting firms, and you can take any name, whether it is Moody's, whether it is the ENY, McKenzie, Bernstein, and so many internal studies that have been done by many of us, it clearly points out that uh, by, say, 2025, we are looking at the share of electrification to go to, say, anywhere between 5 to 10 percent. And by 2030, we are looking at around 20 to 30 percent, which uh, simply means that the IC engines will be a continued dominating uh, workhorse for the applications across the automotive sector, number one. The number two, if you look at the plans by the government of India, and here I am bringing the domestic perspective, 
there was an announcement that was made in the recently conducted mu summit in delhi by minister of uh, petroleum and natural gas mr dharmendra pradhan who said very clearly that they would like to expand the cng infrastructure in the country by 10000 gas stations in the next few years time and uh, we also have seen a news uh, few months back that there is going to be the investment that would be made for the refineries to augment the capacities and even to generate the grassroots level new refinery the third point from my side is uh, if we look at the focus that is being given by the government for the alternate fuels and the renewable fuels whether it is uh, ethanol methanol dme bio cng the bio diesels of the world i think it very clearly points out that there is a focus being given to promote the alternate forms of the fuel and therefore the related ic engine technology if we see from the manufacturers perspective the oems continue to invest in development of the ic engines whether it is for improving the emission profile or it is for improving the fuel economy so large sums of money are being invested uh, by the oems as well as by the component industry so as to improve the ic engine's performance from the government point of view there is a very active regulatory regime which is now in place and we will have the bs6 regulation in 2020 and as we speak we are discussing about even the fuel economy norms for across the board not just for the as a cafe norm for the m1 vehicles but even for the heavy duty vehicles about 3 and a half ton category vehicles and so this clearly shows that with such kind of an active regular regime there is going to be an accelerated development and the improvement of the conventional ic engines now coming to the way that we have to look at the ic engines i think this is not the first time that the ic engines are challenged if we look at uh, go back to more than say 100 years in 1900 in the year 1900 the share of the electric vehicles in us was about 38% the share of the steam powered vehicles was 40% and uh, the share of the gasoline powered vehicle was about 22% but since then the ic engines have come a long way and uh, millions and billions of ic engines have been produced in the intervening period so in my opinion the ic engine today sits at the pinnacle of its technology it's quite sophisticated uh, uh, the piece of a machine and uh, is being continuously improved from the overall if we look at this the way the automotive sector is contributing to the growth of the nation and also to the gdp last year the industry produced uh, more than 3 million vehicles i am talking about india we have the cagr for the automotive sector which is anywhere in the region of uh, 6.5 to 7% for the last few years and if you look at the share of the automotive sector in the gdp of the country it is around 7.1% today which is expected to go to around say 12% by say in the next decades time so therefore unless there is a strong viable alternative option available i don't think that we can have a situation like you know the ic engines will be dead sooner so many things have to coexist and therefore there is a strong contender to the ic engine which nowadays we talk about the electric vehicles but for electric vehicles to become the mainstream uh, technology there are many hurdles that we all aware of i don't want to get into those topics whether it is in terms of the cost the range anxiety in terms of charging stations so many things have to come together and therefore uh, to me i think the inflection point is still some years away but whether it will 100% replace the ic engines it's going to be a question mark so overall i would like to summarize by saying that uh, it's very difficult to fix the date by which the ic engines would be dead but surely the share of the ic engines will come down as we speak and uh, i think who knows i mean one was talking for many years back about the doomsday for the uh, fuel scenario that the oil wells are going to be dry and uh, no fuel and all that so i don't think these 
uh, kind of uh, you know the doomsday times are valid uh, today so therefore at least from my point of view i am unable to fix a date when the ic engines would be dead the share will come down but at the same time i am not saying that we shouldn't focus on the electrification i mean that's something which has the twin objectives as far as the india is concerned of course it's a clean zero emission technology and at the same time it's going to reduce the dependence on the crude uh, for the country like india so having said that i am wanting to put a balanced perspective by saying that the ic engines will continue for a long time thank you thank you mr petka uh, quickly we'll move to mr mcmurray okay. how do you look at the future for ic engines okay so i think the firstly good afternoon everyone um, the question is is ic engines dead i think the question should be um, in what time frame will IC engines be dead? Because that's probably going to be more relevant for a lot of people. And if you take, there's a number of companies internationally that are talking around what their vision and purpose is. I, if I talk about General Motors for a minute, um, for those people that have seen what our vision is, we have, are looking at a zero emission, zero crash, zero congestion world. So if zero emissions is going to be part of our vision, Long term, you could probably understand what we're thinking as a company. Um, but what is that time frame? If you look at the data from something, an agency like the International Energy Agency that is extrapolating out to more than 2050, um, the information they're showing is that there's going to be IC engines around for quite a long time for a number of reasons. I think first and foremost, um, customers and affordability and customer expectations are always going to be a key part of what's going to drive what, what's the, the, the global propulsion system you're going to use. Um, so if customers are needing a certain level of propulsion that today may not be affordable, for example, with electrification or even 48 volt hybrid systems, then if there's a, an alternative that an internal combustion engine provides, then they're naturally going to go towards that. I think the key for helping internal combustion engines stay relevant for the next several decades is the pressures that the government continues and the social responsibilities that companies feel with things like, for example, in India, the government going straight from BS4 straight to BS6, where they skip BS5. That means you're very serious about emissions and you're very serious about the environment and humanity. So with that, if you're going to use that as the catalyst to drive technology and innovation and you expect companies to spend a lot of money on that, companies are not going to spend money to that magnitude if they think that this technology is going to go away in a very short amount of time. So by, by default, when you put something like BS6 into India, which I think is a really good initiative. It's going to drive the right technology, the right behavior. It's going to do it in the right time frame, but it's going to make it standard for everyone. Everyone's in exactly the same position. The level playing field is important. So whilst there may be some incremental increases at a customer level, um, the customer's going to get what they need without being significantly pushed up into some technology that they may not be ready for. So for, from my perspective, and this is like Brian's view of the world right now, um, I see that there is a number of parallel paths being run um, with most of the industry, and we're all aware of those, but I think there's going to be a number of incremental steps that will continue to happen with IC engines with 48 volts hybrid systems, mild hybrid systems, the PEVs, and some of the next steps with smaller engines, potentially more efficient, with a lot more technology, but they're not going to be disappearing anytime soon. And again, as I said, if you look at data that comes from uh, something like the, the International Energy Agency, who has a lot of information around um, most of the industry, their data is fairly, fairly pointed around at least all the way out till 2050, 2060. Uh, the internal combustion engine percentage is still going to be significant versus all of the other um, options that are available today. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to uh, Rafiq now. What's your view on this? Yeah, so Dipanshu, thanks. Uh, unlike my peers uh, on the stage, uh, they are either OEMs or uh, you know engine people. Uh, Ansys as a simulation company has an advantage to work with all the in 
OEMs globally and India and, and the suppliers and engine manufacturers. So I'll give my background from that perspective and what's happening globally. Uh, and I would like to contextualize uh, what I'm saying for the 2030-2040. So contextual to uh, next uh, 22, 22 years. So you know, if you if you go back, and I would like to relate uh, to this movie Matrix, where Morpheus is asking Neo, uh, he has a he has a blue pill and a red pill. Which which is which do you want to eat? Uh, pop up so I can show you rabbit hole and Matrix, or you are just dreaming. So just imagine if the, the blue pill is electrification and the red pill is IC. I think if you talk now, uh, you know, the new or all of us will have to pop both the, uh, both the pills because you're going to die if you don't go on electrification and you will die if you don't focus and invest on IC. So uh, I think, you know, th that is the, the context I wanted to leave and and again, working with all global OEMs, we have realized that all the OEMs are investing heavily on electrification, yet they are heavily investing on technology and efficiency improvement uh, and emission improvement in the IC engine. So we have to remember that uh, electrification is an effect, not a cause. The, the real objective is how do we reduce emission and reduce greenhouse gas. So the kind of efficiency and improvement which is happening on the IC engine technology, and we are working with all the OEMs, and you know they are using our technology. You know, at least 2030, 2040, IC engine will be there. And uh, you know, if you talk about uh, oil to wheel emissions, then then you know there is still a lot of uh, room for improvement, and a lot of companies, including Mazda. Are, coming on with announcement and engines, which will be at least 30% more efficient. So now very short answer is yes, for the next 20, 22 years, IC engine will reach its uh, penultimate and peak. However, a lot of Europeans and a lot of uh, uh, developed nations have already announced that they will 100% go by electrification by 2040 and 2050 you know, all those data and stats are available and they'll keep changing. So I think that's my broader answer. Going to specific, if, if some supplier or an engine guy is here, I think I would like to, uh, you know, quote uh, Pound Goenka, he made a very good uh, speech on, at the ACMA. Um, and if you look at the stats, like in Indian automotive industry is growing at least 10%. And, and even if you talk about uh, you know, like electrification in India by 20, 30, 30 percent, it still means that the IC engine will go minimum 7 percent. Now, now that's a pretty decent growth for IC engine. Now, 30 is a very idealistic situation. I don't think so we'll reach there. So if you, if you remove the percentage point and there are 10 percent, 13 percent, various reports are there, that means uh, IC engine will grow at least double digit uh, for the next 10, 15 years. I think that, that should give a lot of confidence to the uh, engine and the suppliers community to keep investing into... Uh, now, where the dent will come on the IC engine aspect is, is how the market and the EV adoption happens. And naturally, we have to use common sense over there. The common sense is there that maybe the fleet organization like Ubers and Olas and all, they, they are more worried about their, how much rotation their fleet is doing on the road. So they may be the early adopters because they want to get the maximum ROI of their vehicle because in India and globally the sticker price of electric vehicles is still high. So people, as for personal use, people will continue uh, to use uh, IC engines for a long time. But I think there are low-hanging fruits like the fleet operations, and then we have the long-range uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, they they will be the adopters, and you know, then things will start balancing out. Um, and again, going back to the context, is the EV technology has to improve. We, we we know we can't go into all the infrastructure, lithium prices, and all that stuff. But but again, the simplicity is like the new generation is getting adopted to plug and play. Like they're used to mobile, laptop, uh, you know, iPhone charging. So charging that 
that myth and comfort will come with the younger generation. So again, you know, that, that, that is something which we have to uh, keep. So I think short answer, I think Jin is speaking and for the next 20, 22 years, uh, you know, it will continue to do well. Uh, Dr. Grip, your comments. Yeah, to the question, is the IC engine dead? I do not contradict with what was said before, but I would like to state from my perspective, it is a clear no. The IC engine is not dead unless we make, um, or we, we have decisions on the political side that kills the IC. Uh, e, um, um, well, looking at technologies. But um, what, what we have to face is that the internal combustion engine has a real bad reputation, or let me call it a bad image, for two reasons. The one is the criteria emission and the contribution of the ICE engine to the criteria emission, and the other one is the use of fossil fuel. But when we look at this as engineers, um, I see no reason why we cannot deal with the criteria emissions and get the emissions way down. The IC engines will not look the same. They will use other technologies for after treatment, for the thermal management of the engine, and they will use electrification. Electrification because the electric machine and the combustion engine play very well together. The one can do the dynamics very well, the other one can do the power density very well. Uh, from, uh, with regard to, to carrying uh, the, the fuel. And when it comes to sustainability or to the CO2, right now uh, we burn fossil fuel. But when you take a look at the, um, at the energy system, when we talk about um, electricity becoming available through um, photovoltaic or through wind energy, you immediately get into the topic of how to store this uh, amount of energy and all of a sudden the only possibility, at least from my perspective, in, in my humble opinion, is we need to go into chemical storage. So when photovoltaic and wind energy is available, um, well, there are possibilities that we come to synthetic fuels. And when you now combine technologies that take the emission problem out of the picture, and let me call it an electrified liquid fuel that has the energy density, all of a sudden we have a possibility to have with the IC engine a means for transportation that uh, has a lot to offer. Uh, there was a conscious decision that we, that we went into ICE engines. And, um, well, let me, let me paint the picture. I think we will see a lot of electrification, a lot of use of, um, of the electric motors in conjunction with the ICE, but definitely um, I see a picture when we look into 2030 where there will be more internal combustion engines produced than today, so that the production number is even going up. So I think we need to work on the, on the engineering issues to get this reputation improved on the IC, of the ICE engine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Grip. Uh, you spoke about the, the potential that you talked about, you know, IC engines will actually by, by 2030, the number of engines that are produced will actually grow, right? So, so considering the future opportunity that you see with IC engines, uh, yet to m kind of manage the challenges that IC engines pose, what are the kind of changes that you see IC engines going through over the next decade or so, in terms of design, in terms of structure? Well, I think what, what we will see is that the electrification in form of hybridization is increasing. And that means the differentiating factor is probably not so much the number of cylinders anymore or um, the, uh, the individual technology that goes to, to the engine. Uh, and therefore, probably we will see less uh, variation in the base architectures but um, adapted um, yeah, propulsion system solutions that combine the uh, internal combustion engine with electric motors, um, either as a main source of propulsion or in form of, of uh, range extender in order to keep the 
battery size of uh, electric vehicles small and um, autonomy is still high. So I, I believe we are going into a future where the propulsion system um, needs to be seen as, well, probably a modular system of a combustion um, device together with um, batteries and um, probably uh, the combustion device will see a, a bigger competitor in the long run with hydrogen and fuel cells as the onboard um, conversion device from a chemical en um, energy into electricity to drive an electric motor. Uh, thank you. Mr. McMurray, uh, General Motors overall has been working on numerous technologies in improving the IC engines, right? Uh, be it downsizing, be it forced induction, be it uh, new valve train uh, you know, designs. So uh, from that perspective, how do you look? You, know, you talked about the importance of taking incremental steps in improving, you know, especially when it comes to smaller engines. So for a market like India and other India-like markets, for instance, what is the approach that GM is taking? What, because not every technology will make it to, uh, let's say, you know, smaller mass market uh, vehicles. I'll separate the question. Um, I think firstly, if, if you look at what we're doing as a company, um, again, we're, we're being very strategic about where we place resources and capital. Um, we're very clear on the strategy that we're applying for internal combustion engines and you can see what we're doing with the sizing and the way in which we're tailoring the sizing to certain cars. Um, you can also see that there's certain alignments with um, 48 volt systems and hybrids and things going forward. You know, historically, um, with something like the Volt vehicle, which was, was relatively successful, where it was really like an extended range vehicle in itself. It was a battery supplied vehicle with a small internal combustion engine that supplemented the, the batteries. Um, so we've been working through that for quite some time. And what you realize is that you need to tailor your approach again to that particular customer. And, and I, I said that a minute ago, that we, it, unless the government regulates that you want zero emissions from a particular time, you're going to have internal combustion engines, but they can become more and more efficient. But it needs to be, again, tailored to what's right for the customer and what are they expecting. Otherwise, it, it just won't be affordable. Or the technology may be, not be suitable for that particular market or region. If I look now, and again, if, if a recent example of what General Motors has just released um, with some of its new two-litre turbo engines, which are getting very good acclaim in the Cadillac, um, the variable uh, uh, fuel management systems were put in place. Th these are good examples of technology that we're implementing, and not just ourselves, but others, where you'll continue to drive down the CO2 emissions of the vehicles and, and all the other the elements that we're trying to get pollution out, or the general emissions out of the car. So that will continue to happen. It'll just get down and down and down. If you look here at India and you get a look at the market, uh, this was a market that based on um, a certain fuel type, you know, sub four meter vehicles, was very dominant. Now, if you look at where the market's shifting and the market's starting to come up, um, you know, OEMs are introducing more and more sophisticated vehicles. The introduction of BS6, when it comes along, will automatically drive technology into the vehicle. With that comes a level of education, though, um, because with, with, with increasing um, restrictions on the levels of emissions, the tighter the restrictions. Um, as you put technology in that may not have been uh, understood before, you have to go through and educate the market and make sure that the petroleum uh, suppliers understand the expectations, the local suppliers, the service networks, um, even the dealerships themselves when they're communicating. That needs to be a very thorough campaign, otherwise you'll end up still upsetting your customers. So what do I see happening here in India? Um, BS6 will be a great introduction into the passenger vehicles. I think as it rolls out and becomes more in the commercial area and the two-wheeler area, you'll see you know, a lot more traction. And do I see the engine sizes getting larger? No, I don't. I think it'll still remain around it, where it is. Do I expect more turbos? I would start to think that we're going to see more turbos. Um, and then a lot of the after-treatment systems naturally have to come in. Diesel will continue to play a large part. Um, if you look at your own India petrol chemical projections, you know, India is going to continue to be heavily reliant on crude oil and its imports for the next 30 years, and, and it's increasing as the GDP is growing 
and the market size and the, the growth of the auto industry in India, which is soon to become the third largest in the world, um, that's going to drive a lot more oil um, intake, which says that internal combustion engines are not going anywhere in India for some time, but their efficiency will have to increase, which means their capacity will probably go down, along with the education uh, of the customers. And, and that's really going to be something that every OEM is going to have to really focus on uh, to explain what's needed in the India market so that you don't have customers complaining and warranty issues going forward that people just don't understand. And it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, so when you talk about, you know, 30 years down the line, Mr. Petka, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Uh, estimates uh, world over suggest that by 2050, for instance, 60% of the vehicles will still be IC engine driven, right? But all those engines will then have electric motors and, you know, turbocharging and supercharging coming in. Uh, so from an Indian perspective, as an Indian OEM, how do you look at the... The, the progression that IC engines will make for the kind of vehicles that you uh, bring to the market? Yeah, from my point of view, I think the lines are getting blurred between the Indian automotive vehicles and the global vehicles. I think it's just a matter of time, maybe a few years, that the vehicles that will be manufactured, designed, developed, would be completely at par in terms of the performance, in terms of the sophistication. And by the way, there is a tremendous improvement which is happening in the road network also. So I think it's just a matter of time. We will have the similar technology uh, for the Indian uh, vehicles also. The convergence will happen. And uh, I think the first step anyway is in the year 2020 when we are migrating to the BS6 emission norms. The next step is going to be in 2022 when we are looking at the RDE regulation uh, kicking in. We are also looking at the uh, fuel economy standard which is going to be at par. And uh, by the way, there is a strong focus, even from the government side, is to try to bridge the gap between the Indian uh, uh, automotive technology uh, in comparison with the global technologies. So I think all this will get converged. And uh, therefore, the question would remain that, uh, you know, the affordability will become a key, key question here. And uh, that's where we have to make a choice in terms of a technology, in terms of the fuel type, and surely we won't be in a position to afford to work on number of technologies. So you have the conventional IC-based uh, technologies, you have got the hybridization, and there are various forms of the hybridization, and you have the pure battery electric vehicles. So I think one needs to make a right balance, and if you look at the profile of the Indian vehicles, I think we, we have the very small commercial vehicles, which is a segment not so prevalent in the developed markets and I'm sure that that segment will continue to exist. So we need to have a solution which is typical for the Indian vehicles, the vehicles which ply in the hinterlands of the country to the rural areas and where, you know, the affordability becomes a key, key issue. So I think all this will, uh, you know, fall in place and uh, I'm sure that uh, there is going to be a tremendous role to be played by the IC engines in this journey. All right. Uh, and Dr. Grape, one question uh, straight to you. Uh, what's the role that you see electric propulsion playing in the growth of future uh, IC engines? Well, well first of all, the, the electric propulsion uh, is a technology that is there and it makes a lot of sense and I think it is application dependent. So um, <clears throat> when we have a pure electric propulsion, I um, see a significant increase and if if we think of uh, for instance even uh, larger vehicles let's let's talk about commercial vehicles when it is a, a distribution or a fleet operation electrification makes perfect sense um, the um, long haul uh, application where we transport goods over over wider distances uh, I think that is where the ICE has a significant role. So from my perspective, I see this as a coexisting of the technologies where we need to find the right way on how we balance the requirement for energy density in the tank or in the battery uh, with the uh, efficiency and the, um, well, the, the emission-free 
and I don't see this as, as a criteria emission, but more probably also on noise emission, free mobility that makes perfect sense in, in inner cities. So to answer your question, I think that that needs to be um, a coexistence, a symbiosis of technologies um, playing together and not uh, competing in a way that the one dies and the other one wins. Interesting. Uh, Rafiq, as a simulation software provider, you work with the IC engine players as well as the electric vehicle players. So what is the current state you know, as you see it and how does the future look? I think again, uh, we, we all know that we are living in disruptive times, uh, especially in automotive also. So, you, you know, we, the automotive industry doesn't have luxury now to talk about product development cycle of four years and so, so I think it's now and first time right. So in such a complex competitive environment, uh, when you want to come out with product very fast in the market, very quickly based on the market dynamics, and you want to be at a cost efficient and yet technologically very, very high. And if you look at all three of them, it's, it's like a paradox. So you, you have to maintain the paradox yet, yet, uh, yet not uh, be thrown out of the market. So, so technology and simulation software becomes very, very critical. So gone are the days where, you know, I, I, even if you talk about Indian context that no, the labor is cheap and all. I think we have come to a stage where it's level, level uh, playing field and the only thing which will give companies competitive advantage is uh, using technology in this disruptive time. So what I mean is uh, how can that be achieved? So in a, in a simulation software environment, you, you are doing the entire the vehicle or engine simulation virtually. And, and, and you, 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 we have customers like Lucid Motors or Volkswagen, they, they try to say that we want to avoid the prototype as much as possible till the last stage. There is a, in realistic term, the prototype may only be required if you want to, for compliance reasons, to get your vehicle approved or you want to collect some field data and you're doing some test drive. Except for these two situations, you can completely eliminate the prototypes. So that saves a lot of cost and time. So I think that is a clear, clear. So it is done for mass mission or space and rockets and all. So 100% it can be done for, you cannot make a commercial aircraft and keep crashing it. So yes, it has to be, one flight has to be taken. So I think automotive industry will have to go for that drastic reduction in cycle time and first time right scenario. So simulation technology plays a very, very important role. So on the IC engine side, there is still a lot of improvement areas on the combustion, higher combustion efficiency, and you know, a lot of fuel is getting wasted. So how do you simulate all that environment? So we are burning the right fuel and highest uh, combustion efficiency is achieved. Then there is also a lot of room for improvement on the after treatment uh, 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 while emission is happening. So there is a huge improvement on, on the IC engine on that side of bringing a lot of efficiency. On the, so, so the tools and technologies used for IC engine uh, may differ. When we come to, to, to electric vehicle, the, the software technology is same, but the application areas are different because if you open an electric vehicle and they say, hey, there is no engine and it looks so simple, but no, actually, it's pretty complex uh, because there are multiple electronics and chips, uh, and it's it's a system level simulation has to be done. Uh, so so which is more a little bit more dangerous sometimes even if a small faulty chip can can create a very dangerous situation. So 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 the application of simulation over there is like be it uh, uh, you know we are talking of battery or traction or power electronics or control or, or functional safety, you know, the, the application is different. So, so focus is more on the electronics, systems engineering simulation, EMI, EMC, because there are a lot of electronics, you know, interference happens. So, you know, again, to, to kind of bring a perfect, perfect uh, electric vehicle, uh, there's a lot of thermal heat 
heat generated in batteries, you know, it should not explode. So, you, you know, we, we can simulate all that environment uh, and build your electric vehicles. So, so I think uh, uh, to summarize, simulation technologies will drastically cut down the cycle times, you know, give you innovation, cut down cost, and brings a huge amount of efficiency, both for IC and electric. So in, in that sense, a technology like ANSYS, uh, we, we are peaking because, uh, you know, both, both the side needs uh, these kind of technologies, yeah. Uh, Mr. Petkar, I would, uh, I think we have about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so one final question to you. Uh, so when you talk of uh, these new technologies that we hear, you know, we, somebody, I think Rafik mentioned the Mazda Sky Active engine, right? So, uh, so when you talk of newer technologies like twin charging and you know, uh, new variable, you know, valve designs and cylinder deactivation, uh, do you think, you know, in, from an Indian perspective, uh, are we as an industry ready for, ready for t uh, technologies like that? See, there are certain technologies which are already mainstream technologies. And what you mentioned about the Mazda Sky Active or the cylinder deactivation is something which is, you know, uh, there already. And uh, as we have to, you know, offer the higher level of performance, higher level of emissions, and uh, higher level of fuel efficiency, I'm sure that some of the technologies will get inducted. It's a question of time. Uh, there is a roadmap even much beyond. People today talk about even the two-stroke Apos piston engines and all that. So each of the technologies, as it gets matured, you know, will become sort of a mainstream technologies. So I'm sure this will happen in the course of time. Okay. Uh, can we take some questions now from the audience? Uh, anyone? Uh, do you have a question for our panel? I see a hand there. Uh, I see two hands, three, four hands. Uh, could you please come up to the mic there? Uh, you could use one of those mics. Please introduce yourself and... Thank you. I'm Damodran. Uh, worked in automotive for some years, but now in the aerospace industry. Uh, we have a similar challenge, so we did something called more electric aircraft. But my point here is to the panel, uh, I think uh, going electrification will not only disrupt the emission and technology, the whole economy, especially many countries are highly dependent on the automotive business, for example, Germany. It should be appropriate, stop, you know, like country like India, the affordability and the vehicle to human population, we are very green. So I think this, these are all the places you need to start experimenting in a large scale because the market is green. Whereas advanced countries continue to work on improving this technology. Once it is matured, you can swap. Okay, my, my question is, uh, we are looking at the electrification and emission as a, a single standard across the geography. So this is my question to the panel. Uh, is it a right approach? For example, country like India should stop investing too much on the IC engine technology, invest this money for electric, electric vehicles because there is a green market. Because if, if I take Germany versus India or Europe versus India, the number of people who need vehicle is completely skewed. All right. So someone can answer. Uh, it could be. Who would like to take that, Dr. Greb? Would you take that? I can start. I, th I think the one point that you make is an extremely important one. The mobility needs to be available for all the people, because uh, if if we have solutions that are not affordable, you exclude people from from the economy. And, uh, well, that is definitely not good. And therefore, I think it is absolutely necessary um, that from a, from a uh, boundary conditions, from the political side, that we define what the right um, targets are. So I think we all want to live in a healthy environment. But what the technical solution is, um, I think that is where you 
question gets to, we need to find the solutions that are affordable, and they are affordable for well the entire society to participate, because otherwise I, I believe you, you get into uh, situations that uh, it is not sustainable from, from an economic perspective. People need to move. Uh, typically, there is a strong correlation between GDP and um, between the, the mobility in a, in a society. You need to move goods. You need to move people to where the workplaces are. Yeah, I think Damudran, uh, hello, how are you? Uh, I would like to answer your question in a different perspective. Um, and I think uh, as an Indian, I feel I need to answer this point. I, I think as India, biggest uh, population, economy, growing economy, we miss the, the mobile and solar uh, bus in terms of big, being the biggest consumer, yet the IPs and technologies uh, is not owned by us. So I, I, I think on the electrification side, again, we will be one of the biggest uh, user globally after China, and China is a little ahead on that. So I, we, we have huge opportunity not to miss this bus. And, and I think your, your question and what you're driving to is correct, that uh, as the entire ecosystem, all the OEM suppliers, academia, ecosystem, startup, we need to kind of what we did for uh, IT and uh, you know, uh, back, back office services, we need to latch on this uh, emerging uh, EV technologies and say maybe what Qualcomm, we, we may not be the largest lithium uh, manufacturer because we don't have lithium and we let China or somebody else do it, but, but on the system side and IP side, what Qualcomm is doing for semiconductor side, you know, we, we, we can lead that thing and I think collectively as an industry, uh, we, we need to uh, invest on that side and I think we need to work on our skill, skill development and and academia and start up very, very closely on that side, yeah. Uh, thank you. Dr. Goenka, you had a question? So uh, let me uh, first say that when we were planning this session, uh, the leaders panel, we came up with a provocative title and we were hoping to run it like an old-fashioned debate, getting two people for the motion and two against the motion, but nobody was willing to stand up here and say that ISO engines are dead and that's what has come out here. And it's a good thing for all the suppliers who work on ISO engine to take back with them and all the young R&D engineers who are working on engines because there are many young R&D engineers who today think that they should get out of engines because engines are dead. So clearly you can all see that this panel, which is a very distinguished, very varied panel, does not think that ISO engines are dead, at least in our career lifetime. Okay, now, uh, just very quick questions. <clears throat> Very quick question for uh, two, three questions. One, uh, India has made a uh, decision, uh, Dr. Grebe, to not support hybrid. So your view on that, that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Perhaps uh, Mr. Petker can talk about, is there a price point of crude oil, as crude oil keeps increasing, which will put pressure on ISO engine compared to electric, in terms of affordability of electric. And maybe Brian can talk a little bit about, uh, is there a possibility of lethal injection that can go into ISO engines that will kill it. In the sense, can the governments take a decision in various parts of the world to kill ISO engine because it sounds good, uh, it's politically right thing to do, to say we don't want ISO engines to grow and we want all electric. So perhaps quick, uh, quick views. So we go with you first. So Dr. Goenka, thanks for the question on, on, on the hybrid. I think, the, from my understanding, the decision was very much also driven by how can I determine that the right thing is done. And of course, when I say, well, there's no uh, internal combustion engine in there, well, I take this part out of the equation. I believe from a perspective of um, optimizing um, the, the propulsion systems, that is not um, a sufficient and, and, and good decision because um, uh, the battery electric, that is a great technology and I also think in an Indian environment there are solutions that can be a fit, but it will not be, from my perspective, the 100% uh, contribution. It, it, it requires your lethal injection and that is probably not a good thing. So I believe from a competitive perspective and from a perspective of dealing with resources, in the most effective way, the hybrid is the solution 
that we need to leverage. And um, I think it would be a good thing if the OEMs are supported by the right um, incentive scheme to, to work on, on hybrid in addition. Okay, so I will just answer the second and the third question. I think second question was uh, at what price of the crude we think that the IC engines would be dead. In fact, when I received this topic, I was actually thinking under what conditions the IC engines would be dead. And there are these famous, you know, the four or five conditions which must be met. The one is that if you are able to develop the electric vehicle and offer the price point which is same or the lower than the conventional IC vehicles, then that is a point where the customers will start thinking that they must buy the electric vehicle. The second condition is uh, you must definitely have the charging infrastructure which is equivalent of what today it is there for the conventional liquid fuels. The third point, uh, which is from my point of view, I thought that unless you are able to generate uh, the electricity from the clean renewable source, so it is not about, uh, you know, making the urban areas clean while actually generating the pollution elsewhere and contributing to the ambient uh, overall CO2 emissions. So from my point of view, this is the third point. And I was actually baffling with the fourth point, at what crude price, the, you know, it becomes unaffordable for the common consumers, whether it is going to be $400, $500. I think it's something which mathematics can be <laughs> reverse calculated. But I think it's a very valid point and uh, in my opinion, we thought with, uh, you know, the retail fuel price of the gasoline going to 90 plus, diesel going to 74, 75, you know, it will dampen the, uh, uh, you know, the sentiment in the market, but at least the data shows the commercial vehicle industry is going strong and the passenger vehicle industry may be for the number of reasons that it is little subdued in the month of September. I don't think uh, even if it goes up by another, say, 10, 20 percent, it will make a big material impact. But I think somewhere it will start pinching. So I think I do not know exactly what would be that point. It all depends on confluence of many factors coming together at that point of time, not just the crude price. I think the third question, uh, if you just help me to recall. Um, so, so again, Dr. Wayne, thanks for the question. My, um, again, I'll give you my opinion on this. There's been a number of countries around the world um, who, who came out with some fairly strong statements of when electrification would be in place completely. And I think in pretty much every case, they've now had to back away or soften their approach a little bit or extend the time um, for, for a number of reasons. And one of, one of them is that that there is still a lot of work that has to be done on customer acceptance for EV vehicles. And so um, just because someone says you now must drive an EV vehicle doesn't mean that the customers are going to be happy about driving an EV vehicle. And we've learnt over time that even when you get the range to be fairly significant, there is still range anxiety that people suffer and have around an electrification or just an electric vehicle. So, so that is not a small problem to deal with. Um, then, then comes the next step, which is around the infrastructure to reliably charge your vehicles. And again, there's a number of strategies playing out around this at the moment, and I don't think there's any one that has the lead on it. Um, but if you're driving an electrification or electrified vehicle, and it takes you half an hour to charge your vehicle, um, what do you do during that half an hour? And where do you go? What, what, what do you do if you're on a family vacation or a family trip or you're driving somewhere and you've got to stop for half an hour? These are real challenges that as countries wholeheartedly went and said we want to become an electrified country, have had to realise that maybe that's not the right uh, way to go as quickly. What I do think will happen though is this. I think there will be some countries where certain cities are nominated to be an electrified city. And they will use that as a test case and they'll start small and they'll build the infrastructure around that and get a groundswell happening around that city and expand accordingly and use it as, if you like, a little bit of a test hub 
to figure out some of the challenges with moving people around and moving vehicles around and charging and infrastructure and how to manage some of the, the customer concerns that might be out there. So, so I see going forward, countries won't make wholesale decisions on electrification, which is why no one's willing to give up IC engines. And I do want to pick up on one point you said in a minute, Dr. Guenka. Um, but they will use test hubs and strategically pick which cities that they want as their test hubs. Um, the point Dr. Goenka made, I think, is a very good one, that there's four different people up on the stage, and I think, generally speaking, across the industries, um, everyone's of the consensus that IC engines are going to be around for quite some time. Um, it's interesting that there is a discussion that I think is happening in pretty much every company right now, and I can speak about this on behalf of my own company, there is what's affectionately called Auto 1 and Auto 2. And everyone now wants to become Auto 2 engineers because Auto 1 is dead. And so Auto 2 engineers are very happy with themselves and Auto 1 engineers are wondering what their future is. Um, I, will, I can, with a lot of confidence, tell you if you're an Auto 1 engineer, you're doing two things of value. Number one, you're putting bread on the table, which means you're paying the bills that is needed for Auto 2. And the second thing you're doing is you've still got a long career ahead of you for the next several decades because nothing's going to change of that significance other than the fact that we're going to get more and more technology and more and more interesting things happening in internal combustions, not less. So for those who are working on Auto 1, don't despair, you've got a long career ahead of you, okay? I hope that helps, Dr. Guanka. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have time for one last question? Okay, we'll take one last question here, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Avnish Dongde, and I'm pursuing my PhD at RWTH Aachen University. I agree with the consensus of the panel over here, but I would like to play a bit of a devil's advocate here. So what is the risk, uh, taking one of the key words from from the title over here, what is the risk that the inflection point that we are talking about can actually occur earlier because of some disruptive technology in the field of batteries, supercharging, or even uh, other associated fields like uh, uh, nuclear fusion, or because of political disruptions to the oil supply or to the supply of precious metals that will push us quicker to the electrical vehicles and uh, are we are are is the auto industry considering this risk and in what way i, I think i'll try to give a very simple answer uh, uh, and we said the ice engine is not dead uh, but this is again a personal point and opinion uh, uh, i i think india should latch on electric vehicle as soon as possible because the biggest problem india as economy is facing is we are having a lot of financial drain on our economy uh, because we are importing almost all the crude oil, uh, you know, and, and that is putting a lot of pressure and, and you know on the street what is the price, correct? And that is creating a lot of unhappiness. So I think looking from that perspective alone, it's, it's very prudent for India to latch on this. And I was in a session a few weeks back in Delhi and uh, Mr. Gill from um, Hero Motor came out with a very good proposition which he has already given to government is that if you just put seven dollar or 500 rupees cess on every IC vehicle which is sold, government will have enough money to immediately, uh, you know, start the entire infrastructure investment which we are talking and everybody is waiting for government to do something. Uh, you know, that can be taken care of. So, I, I, you know, that's again a personal point of view, but uh, I think we need to uh, cash on or go immediate uh, as far as India is concerned. And, Again, that's a personal opinion, yeah? Okay, uh, so I've been indicated we must stop here. Thank you, gentlemen, for being such a wonderful panel. Thank you for being a lovely audience. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Dipankshu and the panelists. May I request the moderator, Dipankshu Sharma, to give memento to Mr. Brain, Vice President, Engineering and Operations, General Motor Technical Center, India. May I request Mr. Rajendra Petkar, Chief Technology Officer, Tata Motor Limited, to do Mr. 
Mr. Rafik Somani, Area Vice President, ANSYS India. <laughs> Last but not the least, Dr. Yuv Dieter Grip, Executive Vice President, AVL, Austria. And to the moderator, may I request Mr. N. Bala Subramaniam, Organizing Committee Chair, FISITA 2018, to present the moment to Thank you, gentlemen. Let's give a big round of applause for these wonderful panelists.